The most important scientist to ever exist was an ethnic Serbian. He discovered multiphase alternating current, better known as AC, which powers everything you use pretty much in your house. This man invented or otherwise discovered rotating magnetic fields, magnifying transmitters, wireless power transmission, wireless communication, robotics, bifuelar coils, telegeodynamics, electrical commutators for motors, bladeless turbines, x-rays, arc light systems, superconductivity, electric vehicles, and general polyphase systems. From everything you use in your modern life, a line can be drawn back to this man. He even invented the radio, and for all you Jeopardy watchers out there, his name was not Marconi. In 1943, the United States Supreme Court reviewed the patent owned by Marconi and decided it would be best to give credit where credit is due and awarded Nikola Tesla with the patent for radio about 45 years after he had actually done it, which was several years before Marconi even applied for the patent. Tesla's contributions to science and the world in general are on par with man's mastery of fire. Now, you could argue with that, but if we realized your reality for just a second, you'd have hot meals, but you'd have to come reply to me in person or send me a letter through the Pony Express. Now, back to something you could argue with. Ever since Tesla left the region in 1884, it has produced several notable but disappointing contributions to the world. Let's start with the group of Serbians who killed Archduke Ferdinand, which precipitated World War I. These Serbians were not unlike Americans in a sense that they felt they had some manifest destiny to obtain. And the Archduke, who represented the nobility of Austria-Hungary in general and was heir to the throne, was holding them back somehow, as Serbia was under their rule at the time. The Austria-Hungary reaction to this assassination was quick against the Serbian territory, and a series of alliances and declarations then started the big one, the war to end all wars, it was said. Now, the Serbian extremist groups at the time can be hailed as heroes or vi villains, depending on your slant, as it was an action of independence, which they didn't get, but still, it was the Allied or Atente powers that took their side. After the war, Yugoslavia was formed, and although Serbia was a major component of it, they still didn't like it. That didn't matter, because World War II popped up and left Yugoslavia relatively up for grabs. To keep this short, Josip Tito, better known as Marshal Tito, formed the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and divided the region further in order to diffuse political influence. Immediately after World War II, he began a campaign to cleanse Yugoslavia of ethnic Germans, in conjunction with the USSR and brought to you by the letter H. That was not the last homage to Hitler Yugoslavia would produce. Tito's power held until his death in 1980, and the country predictably fell into complete and utter chaos. The Socialist Serbian Republic was formed by a little guy with a funny-looking head named Slobodan Milosevic, who had been working very hard to become friends with the ethnic Serbs, a group that had proven themselves as people who do whatever the fuck they want as long as it was in the name of Serbia. He exploited this with a butcher's precision. Slovenia and Croatia split from the former Yugoslavia in 91, followed closely by Macedonia and Bosnia-Herzegovina, but Slovo had other ideas. His whole thing was, anywhere in the Yugoslavian territory there are Serbs, then the Serbs have a right to rule, which is what they believe too. Which is why he exploited that. This started a storm of ethnic Serbian reprisals and riots throughout the former Yugoslavia and in Bosnia. They, su they succeeded in overthrowing the Muslim majority from power, bringing it under de facto control of Slobo. Throughout the Yugoslav Wars, all of which Slobo perpetrated by proxy, of note here was the United States' immediate proclamation that it supported the independence of Bosnia or Herzegovina, knowing damn well it would start a war. To make a long story short, little old semi-independent Kosovo, who had been cuckolded all these years, just like Serbia, started to say something, at which point Slobo said, you shut up, playtime is over. Milosevic got busy purifying Kosovo in plain sight. Albanians and Muslims were executed, hundreds of vill villages were burned, Hundreds of thousands were led to the border and told to stay out. When NATO intervention began, the Serbian military began dressing up as Red Crescent and Red Cross workers to avoid bombings, all the while executing people in plain sight and holding thousands in concentration camps, not unlike the ones Hitler popularized in the 40s. Yeah, my little story of Serbia does have some humor, because in the mid-90s, after a couple years' war in the former Yugoslavia, all the leaders were effectively forced by the United Nations to reform a confederation of republics, and Lil Slobo was elected chairman and continued his purification. When the Serbs realized they were being used as tools rather than fighting for independence, they called for his resignation. Now, Milosevic was indicted in May 1999 during the Kosovo War, 
by the UN's International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, that's hard to say, for crimes against humanity in Kosovo. They upped these charges later on by adding the not-so-subtle genocide charge from actions in Bosnia and war crimes in Croatia. Now, let's be fair and recognize all of the opposing forces to Slobo who committed war crimes themselves. In fact, it was feared that Slobo would mention those NATO bombing raids because they were in defense of the Kosovo Liberation Army, who themselves were responsible for multiple massacres. Under the standing rules, they would have to indict the leaders from the NATO nations for war crimes too. It seems, then, when you look at it from another perspective, and I mean one outside of Yugoslavia, you realize there wasn't a single entity within Yugoslavia, and many outside of Yugoslavia, not bent on wiping the other out. As I mentioned, the KLA before, the Kosovo Liberation Army was a paramilitary group recognized as a terrorist organization by the United States until 1997, which is about the same time it began serious attacks on ethnic Serbs and revolts against the state in general. They conducted mass ex executions of anyone who they believed to be collaborators with the state. They were only playing on par with the course, though, uh, as they were in court at the exact same time as Slobo and under indictment for war crimes, and many of the KLA's leaders were convicted. It was in the defense of Kosovo that NATO acted, but it can easily be argued that they were working alongside the KLA, which would make them guilty of war crimes in a war which had no clear fronts, no clear sides, and honestly, no clear outcome. Slobo's nickname is Butcher of the Balkans, and it's a lot unlikely he'll ever live it down considering he's dead. One notable figure who somewhat defends Slobo against some of the more serious charges is none other than uh, Noam Chomsky, who recognizes that Slobo was a bad guy but says pretty much what I do about the KLA, and raised eyebrows in 1999 and saying that calling what happened in Kosovo genocide was an insult to the victims of Hitler. Now here I split because call it what you like, every side in the Balkan Wars had an official doctrine of terminating the existence of other ethnicities in the region and carried out that doctrine with some relative success. Slobo happened to be a figurehead and the leaders are always the excuse in the trial. The Nuremberg defense doesn't apply though, just following orders is not an excuse. The paradox lay in the details though, because refusing an order in a time of war under most nations laws is punishable by death. That sounds like a law leaders would write, you do as we say or we will kill you, but if you ever prosecute it, haha, you can't say it's our fault. In order to protect themselves from blanket prosecution, and on the back of that token, leaders are always the first prosecuted, so go figure. The United States Army functions under these rules, which is one of the more subtle controversies surrounding the Abu Ghraib prison thing. So, to close up this cursory history lesson, I'll say that the Balkan Wars produced no heroes and left the region in the exact same shape it had been in since the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, ironically. Now, last week, Kosovo formally declared independence from Serbia. The United States, in a repeat of history, quickly recognized the new republic, which, in a repeat of history, caused the Serbs to riot, attacking the United States Embassy. The U.S. has ordered all non-essential personnel out of Serbia, and Serbia has withdrawn its ambassadors from the U.S. In this clear repeat of history, there is a pretty big difference. The former Yugoslavia has been gone for quite a while, and although there's still tension in many of these areas, it's been relatively quiet since the Balkan Wars, and perhaps it's because enough of the various ethnic groups got their own little chunk of land, all except Kosovo. Honestly, this is a question of ethnic supremacy versus national supremacy, neither of which is good nor reality. Kosovo could be viewed as majority Albanian, and they could just go home to Albania, as Slobodan Milosevic had politely suggested before. And the Serbs could just be happy with having a Serbia, after all this time fighting for it, and let Kosovo have their own republic. This is one of the more ugly sides of humanity that I have always seen but never liked addressing. The idea that an ethnic or national identity is somehow justification for stupidity by way of war, not to mention religious ascendancy. I mean... I myself have an ethnic identity, but it's only useful and apparent when I drink, in which case stupidity is not only tolerated, but outright accepted. It's more complicated than that, of course. Serbia and Kosovo are an excellent example of the two sides. Pure nationalism in Kosovo, in which people who live there own the land and refuse to give it up and have developed the Kosovar identity. Serbia believes in a manifest destiny in which they have some kind of God-given right to rule a certain percentage of the earth based on ethnic supremacy or religious ascendancy, both of which are ridiculous on anything less than a geopolitical analysis of politics. 
let's throw an extra food for thought in here. Religion works exactly the same way. Think of all of the wars and executions perpetrated by religious zealots, especially the Catholics. So what a dynamic we have, three dispositions a human can have. Well, one could simplify this whole thing by saying that the land I own, upon which my house sits, is the Republic of John. I could create a federation in my neighborhood of properties, either by force or not, and declare myself leader of this new republic. And if anyone resisted, I could have them terminated, which would be unfair because they own the property. If I were to be overthrown, what happens to the republic? Would a new president be elected? Would another federation of properties attempt to stage an election to obtain some influence over my neighborhood? Or would the republic disintegrate into several republics, and would those republics respect each other's sovereignty? Or would they attempt to seize power by cleansing the neighborhood of those who supported me, regardless of their political positions in the absence of the republic I created? Would there be individuals who felt like, because perhaps they were born here or nearby, that this land belongs to them inherently, and would they attempt to seize the entire neighborhood based on that concept? What about the group of houses in the cul-de-sac who have just been sitting quietly waiting for their opportunity to declare independence? Lots of fun questions can be raised in this direct parallel to geopolitics, but the most important question is, why can't people, and I mean all people, just be happy owning a house? There's plenty of undeveloped land outside of the immediate neighborhood for their kids to move to, or would they rather the whole family live in one house, or they and their relatives attempt to take over everything by numbers, and that perceived land right I mentioned earlier. That brings to light the incestuous nature of ethnic identity. Honestly, it's kind of creepy. Let's not forget the prophet who was born in the house down the street who said everyone who lives in you know, an odd number of street address or just some random houses are God's chosen people and therefore naturally own the land. Should everyone just give up and submit to God so they can keep their land? Can they trust the chosen people to let them stay? Think about those questions for a while. They are relevant and it's a simple way to understand conflict and will to power. It's the dominant few among us who would even bother creating a republic otherwise known as a neighborhood association to make sure people are cutting their grass and their garbage cans are in the correct position. It's all about perceived legitimacy and our willingness to recognize it. On a macro and micro level, it all works the same. Property rights in the United States are pretty clear about your personal privacy and it's only if you choose to recognize a place or place yourself under the authority of a neighborhood association are you subject to its rules. If you do recognize them, you can either play along or pay the fines, or you can simply have all your neighbors not like you. There's no law they can apply in which you can be evicted from one of these neighborhoods as long as you pay your mortgage. They can be assholes to you and write you nasty letters, but they can't throw you out. Now, if the association were the property owners and you were renting, things would be different. See what I'm getting at? A state's law may infringe on a right guaranteed by a federal government, but who's to protect me from the federal government? Hopefully... The highest level of government over you, wherever you live, respects these fundamental human rights and decides not to kill you and people like you. But some aren't so lucky. The world is changing, though. Many governments do recognize these fundamentals, and for the majority of humans, that's great because all we want to do is eat our cheeseburgers, watch The Simpsons, and sleep without fear of our government or the Roman Catholic Church. For the most part, that's life. In this line of thought, will to power can be seen as a purely evil thing, a selfish pursuit that offers nothing to the advancement of man or, or even oneself, just a means to an end. That's why I started all of this with a few words about a little known but enormously important ethnic Serbian named Nikola Tesla, who pursued his intellectual curiosities with the expressed intention of advancing man beyond his current state. He never wanted to be in charge of anything. He never attempted any hostile takeover, unlike his rival Thomas Edison, a man who truly displayed a will to power. No, Nikola Tesla can be viewed as a workhorse of science. He only asked for more funding for more science, and that's exactly where he spent it. No earmarks, no pork belly spending. He is a model, at least to me, of not only the god of electricity and pioneer of science in general, but of what humans are capable of. They instead choose to pursue positions of dominance over others and personally contribute nothing to society. Or they choose to devote their lives to making sure the world recognizes their ethnicity and gives them some land. And it all looks silly when you realize how much of your life and intellect you are wasting with these things. Tesla not only did it for mankind, but he did it because it was fun, the latter of which is truly the most important thing. Why do we worry so much about religion? ethnic identity and national pride when we could just go to where we can express ourselves like Tesla did when he moved to America. I had the birth of 
the Industrial Revolution been taking place in Japan, the very first wireless communication would probably have taken place in Tokyo, courtesy of Tesla. A sad majority of people never look beyond the petty little things, struggling their whole lives to find others to identify with, and even when they find those people, they require land to practice it on or require the taking back of the land because it was given to them by God or whatever crap they choose to believe. The truth is, they will never amount to anything outside of that belief, and it's not a relative argument. You have people who live lives and express themselves, and those that don't, and most don't. And all of those that don't share one thing, at least one of the three dispositions I mentioned earlier, if not all, and rely on the few who truly stretch themselves out and live for everything, even opinions. Tesla wasn't just a scientist ahead of his time. He is the model of what man can be, laying aside religious, ethnic, and national identities to do what he thought was important. Anyone who says one of these three things is the most important thing in one's life is deluded and simply following orders. But as we all know, that's not a valid defense in court. On that note, God bless America.